about uh, 19 years ago, uh, our family were fellowshipping uh, at a little church on the border of Norfolk and Suffolk in the United Kingdom called Cloverfield Community Church. And it played a significant role in our journey to South Africa because it was while we were there that Bishop Frank Retief came and did a mission in our church and stayed with us and uh, following that invited us to come and spend Christmas with him here in Cape Town. Uh, Anyway, that's by the by, but it's a great joy to have Helen Jarry with us this morning. Helen is the pastor of Cloverfield Community Church. Um, Helen, you're really welcome. It's lovely to have you with us. Do please go and talk to her after the service. Uh, In the meantime, let's have our Bibles open at page 751. And please also have the white bulletin open, because you'll find on the inside of the right page... um, an outline of where we're going in the next few minutes. And while you're doing that, let's ask for God's help. Heavenly Father, it is our joy to worship you together and to bring you the adoration of our hearts and the consecration of our lives. We thank you that you are our Father that you know us through and through, and that your word is able first to find us, then to speak to us, and then to transform us. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, this passage will come alive to our hearts and minds this morning. And so we say together, speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, this time last year, we were wrestling, weren't we, with serious water restrictions in Cape Town. Uh, It was a difficult time. Uh, We lived in constant fear of day zero and the hideous possibility that a day might actually come when you would turn on a tap and nothing would come out. And I think some of us realised, perhaps for the first time in that experience, just how essential water really is. Now that, I think, helps us to begin to understand our passage this morning. Because at one level, John chapter 4 is all about water, and it's all about being thirsty. So, if you want a verse to get us started, I think verse 15 is as good as any where the Samaritan woman says to the Lord Jesus, give me this water. Now in that part of the world, uh, water was the difference between life and death, uh, just as it is, of course, in many parts of Africa still today. And that's why in the Bible, salvation is often described as water, because without water, we will all die. So, for example, uh, Isaiah chapter 12 and verse 3 says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. Salvation, water. Or what about Jeremiah chapter 21 verse, sorry, chapter 2 verse 13, where God says, My people have forsaken me, the spring of living water. So God in that verse actually describes himself as the spring of living water. Now those verses and others like them are the background to John 4. On the surface it's all about water but beneath the surface it's really about salvation. A Gentile woman Uh, an outsider with tremendous problems, asks the Lord Jesus to be her personal water supply. Give me this water. And you see, this chapter is teaching us something absolutely vital about who Jesus is and why Jesus came. He is the giver of water, the water of life, and of course he still is today. Now what we see in this rather lovely story 
should actually be happening today through every single one of us who call ourselves Christians. People ought to be coming to us and saying, well, where can I find this water? Where can I find this salvation? And yet, how often do we see that actually happening? How often in the last year has somebody come along to you or to me and shown genuine interest in salvation? Well, it's not as often as we would like, is it? Now, although John chapter 4 is not primarily a manual on personal evangelism, in many, many ways, as we see the Lord Jesus talking with this woman, we are being given a pattern for witnessing. We're being encouraged to pattern ourselves on him, to act as he did, and to do what he does. So, if we're hoping that more people will come to us in 2019 and say, give me this water, what needs to happen? Well, if you look carefully at Jesus in this passage, I believe there are at least nine things that we can learn. Nine features of our Lord's example. Now, don't panic. Don't reach for the smelling salts. We're not going to be here till tomorrow lunchtime. Uh, Actually, by God's grace, we'll finish smack on time. But I want you to notice with me these nine characteristics of our Lord's approach to a needy human being. And as we do this, I want you please to think about what each one of these characteristics might look like in your life this week. So, characteristic number one. Jesus embraces God's providence. Come with me to verse four. Verse four. Now he had to go through Samaria. He had to do it. And the Greek word there means that it was absolutely necessary. There was no alternative. As far as the Lord Jesus was concerned, there was no other option. We actually saw the same word last week in chapter 3 and verse 7, where Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Same word here. Jesus must go through Samaria. But why? I mean, it wasn't the only road up north. It wasn't the only way to travel from Jerusalem up to Galilee. In fact, it wasn't actually the normal route that a Jew would take. The Jews didn't actually like to go through Samaria. Uh, They didn't like the Samaritans and they wanted to avoid walking on Samaritan soil, if at all possible. So the normal route for a Jew would have been to cross the Jordan River somewhere near Jerusalem, then travel up the east bank until they came to Galilee, and then cross back over again. And uh, that way they could avoid Samaria altogether. But the Lord Jesus, we're told, had to go through Samaria. Now why did he have to go that way? Well, because it was, I suggest, a compelling necessity. He was constrained by God. Of course, we don't actually know what was going on in his mind. We don't know how he knew that he had to go that way. But he was aware of the fact that this was something that he had to do. Surely that's what John's telling us. Because there was a particular woman that his father had planned for him to meet and to talk to. And that's the only reason he had to go that way. So whatever Jesus knew or didn't know at this point, we can't say precisely, but he was conscious of his father's leading. There was an awareness in his mind that this is the way he had to go because God had a particular purpose in mind. Now, friends, I'm not saying that God always guides us as clearly as that so that we know precisely what it is we have to do. I think most of us find that our lives follow a fairly predictable routine. But surely this is reminding us that God is continually ordering all the details of our lives. 
There are no chance meetings. There are no coincidental encounters. Every second is under God's control. There is a purpose and there is a plan for where we go and who we meet and what we say and even what happens afterwards. And I'm simply making the point, I think, that each one of us ought to be conscious of that. You know, we're not meant to drift through our lives with our eyes closed. Rather, we are to be aware of God's providence in our circumstances. And so when we find ourselves talking with somebody, we ought to be thinking, well, I'm not here by accident. I'm here in the wise providence of God. When I got up this morning, God had planned for me to meet this particular person. He knew that this conversation was going to take place. It was part of his plan for my life. And you see, every encounter could potentially have eternal significance. It might not, but it is possible. And it is a thrilling perspective to live with that in our minds. That every moment of our lives is potentially hugely significant. We can never say, nothing important is going to happen today. Because this could be the day when God brings you face to face with somebody and you will say something to them that will have a profound impact on their lives. God's providence. Secondly, Jesus pays the necessary price. Now you'll notice in verse 6 that we're told that Jesus was tired, tired from the journey. Now that word in the original means he was absolutely worn out. He was exhausted. It's actually one of the rare comments in the New Testament that remind us of his humanity. Now, that he was a real man, a real human being. And we're told that it was about the sixth hour, which means that it was noon. And uh, that, of course, was when the sun was at its hottest. It was, I suppose you would say, siesta time when the shops were closed and everybody was resting from their work until it got cooler. So here you have a tired, weary, exhausted, thirsty man at the most difficult time of day and in all probability all he wanted to do was sit down and rest. But somebody comes. And notice, will you, that the Lord doesn't say, well, I'm terribly sorry, but it's my time off. Um, it's the lunch break. No, he puts his exhaustion aside and he gives this woman his full attention. He gathers his faculties and he gives himself to talking to her. Now, friends, you see, God does not always give us opportunities at times that are the most convenient for you and me. In fact, I think often those opportunities come when we're busy, uh, when we're tired, when we're not feeling very well, uh, when we're stressed, when we're distracted, and in truth, when the last thing we feel like doing is talking about the things of God. When everything inside us is screaming, this is just not a good time. Now the question of course is, are we willing to go past that? Are we willing to see the need to do what Jesus did and to put away our tiredness and to give our attention to the person that Almighty God has brought to our front door? Are we willing to suffer in order to seize a God-given opportunity. Jesus pays the necessary price. Thirdly, Jesus crosses barriers. Now, there were at least four barriers between these two people. For a start, there was the barrier of race. 
Uh, There was a long history of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, Many Jews would have preferred the company of Gentiles to Samaritans. The rabbis taught that uh, if as a Jew you met a Samaritan on the road, what you should actually do is start walking in the ditch to prevent your two shadows touching each other. They disliked the Samaritans so much they didn't even want their shadows touching on the road. So there was a racial barrier. Secondly, there was the barrier of religion. Uh, The Samaritans had a kind of corrupted idea of the Jewish faith. They only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament and uh, instead of making the journey to worship at the temple in Jerusalem, they worshipped on Mount Gerizim, which is in Samaria, and a number of other differences besides. Now, I think it's absolutely fascinating in this story to see how winsome and how sensitive the Lord is towards this woman. He's very compassionate towards her. And yet, when this particular issue comes up, Jesus does not steer away from the truth. Did you notice that? He makes it very clear to her in verse 22. He says, You Samaritans worship what you do not know. Salvation is from the Jews. He speaks to her very directly and very bluntly. And he says to her, effectively, in this particular matter, you are wrong. And uh, he goes on to say, it's from the Jewish people that Messiah will come. It is to the Jewish people that God has revealed himself most fully. So you have the barrier of religion. But then you also had the barrier of gender. In those days, men simply did not talk to women in public. It just didn't happen. Uh, A husband wasn't even supposed to speak to his wife in public. It just wasn't done. The, The rabbis said, it is forbidden to give a woman any greeting. And if you couldn't speak to a Jewish woman in public, how much less a stranger and a Samaritan? And that's why, of course, the woman says to the Lord Jesus in verse 9, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman, how can you ask me for a drink? The barrier of race, the barrier of religion, the barrier of gender, and then, of course, the barrier of sin. I mean, here you've got the pure, sinless Son of God and he's talking to this woman and she is living with her sixth partner. Um, There's no longer even a pretense of marriage. I mean, she's gone way past that. This is the sixth man she's been living with. And in the culture of those days, well, she would have been considered a prostitute, an immoral woman, and no respectable man would have gone anywhere near her. And that, of course, is why she's coming to draw water at noon, because nobody drew water at noon. You went to the well when it was cool, first thing in the morning, last thing at night. But she was coming at noon precisely because she knew no one else would be there. She was an outcast. So their friends are the barriers. Uh, Race, religion, gender, sin. And yet, the Lord Jesus crosses every single one. Here are two people who normally wouldn't even look at one another. But the Lord sits down and he talks to her. Now that is a challenge, isn't it? That is a challenge. You know, we say we believe that the gospel is for everybody. But what about our practice? Do we live up to what we say we believe? How many barriers are we willing to cross? Are we willing to cross racial barriers? Religious barriers? Social barriers? Moral barriers? Are we actually willing to reach out to people who are very unlike ourselves. In many ways, people we perhaps normally wouldn't choose to spend any time with. To put the question another way, 
Please think, who are the Samaritans in our culture? And what wells of water are there where we might find them? Jesus crosses barriers. Fourthly, Jesus begins on common ground. Verse 7 is the most brilliant introduction, isn't it? Will you give me a drink? I mean, if you're sitting at a well, it's the obvious thing to say, isn't it? I mean, it's the middle of the day, she's come with her jar, Uh, they're both thirsty. It's a very obvious point of contact. So he's talking to her in language she can understand. Um, And his question, you see, is not threatening, is it? She can relate to it, it's perfectly natural. She's she's not going to go away and say, how weird, what a weird question. No, she's surprised that he speaks to her, but what Jesus says is very normal and it's very natural. It's a genuine request, actually. So think about that. Jesus really is thirsty. So this isn't a trick. You know, this isn't a witnessing technique. Uh, Jesus hasn't been reading a handbook on personal evangelism that says, you know, the first thing you've got to do is Bring up the subject of water and then you can jump from there to the water of life. So there's nothing fake, there's nothing phony, there's nothing unnatural about the question. And it's always wrong, isn't it, to treat people in a phony way or a fake way. We shouldn't use techniques and tricks. We shouldn't manipulate people. Here is a thirsty man. Please give me a drink of water. And notice also that Jesus here is showing her his vulnerability, his need. You know, he, he's not coming across to her, is he, as this superior man who's, some, who's come along to straighten out her life. You know, you poor woman, I've got just what you need. I mean, how patronising would that be? He'll get to her need, but he starts by asking her for help. He's allowing her to feel wanted and to realise that she's in a position to help somebody else. Isn't that brilliant? See, with a stranger, I think it's hardly ever right to sort of plunge into the heart of the Gospel. No, we need to begin where people are. And we need to begin in a genuine, non-manipulative way. Actually, what we need to do is show shared humanity. Something I think very appealing to people, to unbelievers, about asking them for help, it actually brings out the best in them. One writer puts it like this, he says, to acknowledge our need of the kindness, gifts, wisdom and advice an unbeliever can give is encouraging to those who might have been led to expect only scorn or condescension from us. So here we've got a very natural, appealing beginning. But then number five, Jesus provokes curiosity. The woman says, how can you ask me for a drink? And uh, the Lord answers with a very intriguing statement, doesn't he, in verse 10. If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink... You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And then he stops. Then he stops. Doesn't say any more. It's very, very clever. Think about what he said. He said there is a gift. Well, that's pretty interesting because everybody wants a gift. And he's also said, hasn't he, that he is not quite what this woman thinks he is. That he could do something valuable for her. And it's got something to do with living water. And that's all he says. If you knew, if you only knew what I could do for you. I think that sometimes, as witnesses, we say too much. We say too much too soon. Uh, We force ourselves and our message onto people before they're ready to hear it. We don't say something and then stand back 
and let the other person come back to us. Do you agree with that? We're not patient enough. And our Lord here, I think, is saying, be patient. Stimulate their thinking. Provoke their curiosity. Uh, Give people a chance to engage with us and to, to ask their own questions. So, for example, somebody might come up with a a hostile comment and say, I don't agree, Um, I don't think there is a God, and I don't think that a good God would send people to hell. Now, how are you going to deal with that? A good response would be to say, do you know, I used to think just like that. And then stop. Because when you say that, what you're saying is, I don't agree with you, I think you're wrong, but you are not saying it in an offensive way. You're saying, yes, that is what I used to think, but you're also saying, I don't think that way now. Something has changed my thinking. And can you see that by doing it like that, you're giving them the opportunity of asking, well, Why don't you think that way any longer? And then you can tell them. But you see, you're not threatening them. You're not attacking them. You're not putting them on the defensive. What you're actually doing is fishing. Jesus has called us to be fishers of men. That's what the Lord's doing here. He says, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living Water And she takes the bait. She takes the bait. He provokes her curiosity. Number six, he makes her a very attractive promise. Now think about it. Here is this woman uh, who has to make this very painful and embarrassing journey to the well every day. She has to go in the middle of the day because the townspeople were so unpleasant to her. So she can't go in the morning, she can't go in the evening, because all the critics are there. So she has to make this kind of lonely and embarrassing walk every day, uh, fill a heavy jar with water, carry it back by herself, and she has to do that the next day and the next day and the next day. And you can almost picture her in your mind, can't you, as she walks through the village and the people are sort of peeping out from behind the net curtains. You know, there goes that awful woman. And uh, in verse 13, the Lord Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. Well, she knows that. But Jesus continues in verse 14, Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, can you see that to this woman's dry, pained, agonised soul comes the beauty of a promise? Wouldn't that be wonderful, she's thinking, never to be thirsty again. Now friends, every single human being without exception is thirsty for something. They're thirsty for meaning, they're thirsty for happiness, they're thirsty for for, for fulfilment, they're thirsty for love, and every human being is going to the wells of this world with their empty water jars. And they're finding that they have to keep coming back Again and again and again. And sometimes they're going to horrible wells. Dirty, unclean wells. And they are ashamed of themselves. And they're disgusted with themselves. And they hate the journey. And you see, this woman going to the well is just like the drug addict reaching for another syringe or the alcoholic reaching for another bottle, or for the serial adulterer reaching for another partner. And the thirst never goes away. And the next day they're back again. And you see, what you and I can do is we can set the promises of the Gospel before people, offer them the Lord Jesus Christ in the beauty 
of his promises. What he does for human beings. Peace, forgiveness, love, hope, family, salvation. C.H. Spurgeon said that we should make the mouths of unbelievers water for the gospel. It's a great phrase, isn't it? And that's what Jesus is doing here. He makes this woman a very attractive promise. But then seventhly, won't you please notice that Jesus refuses to be sidetracked. Um, If you study the text carefully, it's very obvious that she's beginning to get rather uneasy. She's twigged that there's a little bit more going on here than ordinary H2O. And so her defence mechanism kicks in. Verse 12, she says, Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who do you think you are? That's a defence mechanism. Well, what about verse 20? I think verse 20 is a cracker. Um, Our denomination doesn't teach the same thing as your denomination. Hmm. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Let's have a discussion about the proper place for worship. Let's take the spotlight off me and my problems and have a nice theological discussion. Or verse 25. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Well, I I know that one day we're going to get the answer to all of these complicated problems. Let's just leave them on one side until then. Now, friends, that is camouflage. Have you come across camouflage in your witnessing? Can you recognise it? There are lots of examples. Here's one. Uh, You Christians don't believe in evolution, do you? Why is the church anti-gay? What about all the different denominations? How do you explain that? Now that is all camouflage. And too often, you see, the danger is that we allow ourselves to get sucked into discussing these things with people. I'm not saying those questions aren't important, and I'm not saying there isn't a place for discussing them. But they're not going to save anybody's soul. And actually, very often, they're not real questions anyway. They're ways of dodging the issue. They're ways of taking the spotlight off me and my problems and my need and diverting it onto something utterly impersonal. And although Jesus does here clear up some of the misunderstandings, please notice that he will not allow himself to get diverted. He presses on with the main issue, which is this poor woman and her thirst. You see, the Lord Jesus hasn't walked for hours in the hot sun for a discussion about the relative merits of Canterbury versus Cape Town. No, it is this woman's soul and it is her thirst. Because now, lastly, Jesus gets to the two great issues, eight and nine. Because the whole encounter up to this point has actually been what the theologians would call pre-evangelism. This has been the warm-up. But now, number eight, Jesus identifies her sin. The woman's really interested now, verse 15. Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Yes, she's really interested. And can I say that many evangelists today would, I think, offer her Christ there and then. Uh, They would say, get her signed up. You know, get her on Christianity Explored. Uh, Enroll her in the baptism classes. Please notice the Lord Jesus does not do that. He says, go, call your husband and come back. And what he's doing, you see, is he's driving straight to the heart of her emptiness and her sin. And uh, for you Greek experts, it's a fascinating exercise to actually count the Greek words in the sentences in this chapter. Because it reveals how this woman suddenly tenses up. In verse 9, she speaks uh, 11 Greek words. 
In verses 11 and 12, she speaks no less than 42 Greek words. Very talkative, uh, very relaxed. Verse 15, it's 13 Greek words. Verse 17, three Greek words. Have no husband. Have no husband. She, she's tense. She's upset. She's off balance. And the Lord presses the point. He says, you're right. Quite right. You've had five, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. And Jesus here, you see, very brilliantly, is cutting right to the very heart of this woman's emptiness, the source of her thirst. He's pointing at the moral chaos, right at the very heart of her life, that miserable string of failed relationships. Why is he doing that? Well, because before she can drink the water of life, she has to acknowledge the sin of the past. And friends, you know, for us, isn't that the hardest part? The most difficult part? Speaking to another human being about their sin. There is no way that that is ever going to be easy. If you think it's easy, can I say you shouldn't be doing it? If you find it's easy, there's probably something wrong with you. Now, we know that when we do this with someone, we take a risk that they will be angry with us, uh, that the relationship will be broken, perhaps permanently, and certainly the conversation will be. So it's not easy, is it, to be both sensitive and direct. But it has to be done. It has to be done. Because you cannot come to Christ and receive what he offers unless you are first convicted of your sin. And we can't gloss over that. We can't tiptoe around it. We can't be so sensitive and compassionate and nice with people that we simply never get around to talking about sin. Because, you see, if we do do that, we're false prophets. We're saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And I think that we can learn a great deal from the way that the Lord Jesus does it here. This is brilliant. Because if you read the text carefully, notice, will you, that he doesn't make any accusations. Did you notice that? What he does is he states facts. He says, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. Fact. He doesn't say anything else. He doesn't go on to say, and you are an immoral woman. He doesn't do that. He lets her actually work that one out for herself. Do you see the wisdom of that? The love of that? The grace of it? Surely we can learn from Christ in this chapter and apply it to the way that we reach out to other people. You you can say to somebody... Yeah, so from what you've told me, you're not happy, are you? Um, You've told me this hasn't worked out and that hasn't worked out. Tell me more. Point to the facts in people's lives. Because we need to help them repent. Because, dear brothers and sisters, no repentance, no salvation. No repentance no salvation. Notice lastly, number nine, the Lord focuses on himself. Verse 25, the woman said, uh, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, who speak to you, am he. And there is something very, very special going on here. Because apart from his statement to the blind man in chapter 9, this is the clearest revelation that Jesus gives of himself in the entire Gospel up to the moment of his trial. Jesus reveals himself most clearly 
not to the disciples, not to Nicodemus, not to the Jews, but to a poor, immoral, despised Samaritan woman. I, who speak to you, am he. And he reveals himself to her to bring her to new life. And that, friends, is where our witness must be focused, on the Lord Jesus. Whatever else we say or do not say, we need to speak of Christ. And we need to bring people face to face with him, which is what John does in his Gospel so brilliantly. Because Jesus is the only Saviour. And it is only through faith in him that they can experience and enjoy eternal life. So if you want to grade these nine lessons in order of importance, well then eight and nine are the two most important. Eight and nine are the absolute non-negotiables. Repentance, faith. The others are desirable. The others are good. Eight and nine are absolutely essential. Because without them, there's no evangelism. And then we're told in verse 28, and this is deeply symbolic, I think. Just look at verse 28. Leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town. Well, why does John record that tiny detail that she, she left her water jar? Well, I think John is saying to us that in the deepest sense, this woman's thirst was now satisfied. She's found the living water. She's not now going to have to go hunting for another man. Uh, She doesn't have to go for another sexual experience or conquest. The days of, as it were, carrying her water jar emotionally and spiritually are now over. She doesn't need the jar anymore because she's found the fountain. She's found the river of life. And uh, it's very wonderful at the end of the chapter that she now becomes the most marvellous witness herself because she goes back to her village and testifies to the people. They come out to meet Jesus. And as we close, just please fix your nose on verse 39. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. Now isn't that marvellous? Here's this poor woman. She's changed. She becomes a missionary. She becomes an evangelist. And she goes to reach the very same people who hours before were despising her. People before who had wanted absolutely nothing to do with her or conversely had far too much to do with her. And many of them believed in Christ because of her testimony. I think that is absolutely marvellous. And if she could do it, so can you. And so can I. Because if we're Christians, we've been changed by Jesus and we have the most marvellous story to share. Alita did that, didn't she, in Family Focus. Well, my time has gone. I hope I haven't overrun too horribly. But, uh, friends, Easter is round the corner. So for your homework this week, will you please take time to pray over and reflect on these nine characteristics and ask God to give you opportunities to put them into practice. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you have given Christ as our example in everything and we marvel at his wisdom and compassion as we see him talking with this poor woman so very unlike him in almost every way but with wonderful tenderness and sensitivity directness and courage 
he leads her to acknowledge her sin and to respond to the gospel. Lord, help us to learn from our Master. Help us to be men and women who, at the wells of life, are willing to put aside tiredness and willing to cross barriers and engage people in normal conversation, trusting that, by your grace, doors may be opened, that we may point them to the Saviour, and that we may have the joy of being instruments in your hands, bringing some of our fellow human beings from death to life. And these things we ask for Christ our Saviour's sake. Amen.